Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College here at MTSU, and I'm very pleased to welcome all of you here today. Um, I'm pleased especially to see not only the 50 students who are enrolled in the class, but many other people who are here attending the, uh, the lecture series. It is good to remind you and the people who may be watching this on, on YouTube that the Honors Lecture Series not only is a class, but it's an event that is free and open to the public. The Honors Lecture Series has a different topic each semester, something that is timely, relevant, something of significance, something of great importance. And the timeliness of this semester's topic Climate change is illustrated well by the graphics appearing on our poster that uh, Susan Lyons created for us. We have a polar bear whose natural habitat is under imminent threat, wildfires raging across most of Australia, and widespread flooding in Houston that resulted in massive displacement of people and destruction of property. As reinforced by the responses that many of you wrote in your in-class prompt last week, climate change is a real and serious threat to our planet. Unfortunately, it has become a political, even a religious issue, rather than a human issue that all of us should take seriously. It's something that will fall on this generation to address. Climate change does not care if we believe in it or not, and it's not a problem that can be solved with short-term solutions. One action that all of us can take is to vote. I'm gonna take a moment now. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mary Evans, uh, Associate Professor of History, the Director of our American Democracy Project, who's going to talk to you about our MT Engage event and the importance of voting. Hey everybody, we went over this a bit last week and I told you that I would come this week and hand out something um, concrete for you to have on the campus statewide Civic Summit that MTSU is hosting for the first time ever on the 21st of February. And if you have not uh, received one of these, please raise your hand and I will get one to you. But I want to show the form and tell you that um, you can QR code at the bottom to get registered as part of your um, MT Engage uh, aspect of this particular class and I hope that everybody will register and that we'll have a huge campus turnout for this statewide event. Um, which we'll be talking about voting really as we get ready for the August and November elections in 2020. But of course, more immediately is the fact that we have a Super Tuesday primary quite literally one month from today on Tuesday, March 3rd. And on the back of this same sheet is a QR code for online registration here in Tennessee if you have a Tennessee driver's license. And I've included it now because, um, again, I mentioned this last week, Today is the last day to register for voting in Super Tuesday in the presidential primary. So I need to encourage you now, if you are um, a person who has a Tennessee driver's license and you are not registered, please do the QR code and pull it up on your phone and do it right now because by midnight tonight that option will go away. Also, if you think you are already registered, I would admonish you once again to Google Tennessee voter look up, look up as one word, and just check yourself so that you're not purged or that you think you're registered and you're not, and that will verify it. But online with a Tennessee driver's license, you can take care of it just using this QR code on the back right now, and I would say pull out your phones and do it and get it over with. If you are one of our MTSU students who is from out of state and you do not have a Tennessee driver's license, you need to see me, and we've agreed with um, Dr. Phillips that it would be smart if you would like to to let me handle getting you a paper registration form and we need to do that right now you need to step out with me do it very quickly and you can come quickly back into class because the deadline for submitting those sorts of registrations is at 4 30 and i'm leaving in about 20 minutes to deliver those to the rutherford county election commission so everybody get registered please all right thank you dr evans Voting is a right and a privilege, and I encourage all of you very, very strongly to vote in this year's election. I voted in every major election since I was 18 years old. It's an important thing to do, so I encourage you to do it. As I mentioned, the Honors Lecture Series has a different topic every semester, and 
uh, in, in this, this series, we have speakers from a wide range of academic disciplines, including philosophy, biology, law, geosciences, rhetoric, chemistry, religion, climates, climate sciences, and archaeology, uh, all of whom will offer us their perspectives on climate change. Uh, we're also grateful to have two of our deans in the audience, uh, Bud Fisher, uh, Dean of Basic and Applied Sciences, and John Vile, Dean of the University Honors College. And special welcome to the MTSU Philosophy Department, uh, most of whom are here today. So, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Phil Oliver. Dr. Oliver has been at MTSU since the early 2000s, teaching philosophy courses on diverse subjects, including atheism this semester, childhood, happiness, the environment next fall, the future, epistemology, metaphysics, Anglo-American philosophy, consciousness, evolution, and bioethics. He just finished offering a summer course in the Master of Liberal Arts program called Identity and Truth, and he's offering one next summer called Evolution in America. He's indicated to me that he's always open to working with students on independent readings, independent reading courses, uh, just talk with him about it if you have an idea. He earned his PhD from Vanderbilt and his undergraduate degree from the University of Missouri. His philosophical expertise centers on the American philosophical tradition of William James and John Dewey. He is also a longtime member of our honors faculty and has spoken in this series before. His lecture topic today is There is a Tomorrow reflections on the climate crisis. Please welcome Dr. Oliver. Thank you, Dr. Phillips. Yeah, you'll see I've prepared, as I always do for these events, way too many slides. I don't even have any notion that I'll get, get through them all, but that's okay. I will show you the address where if you happen to be interested, you can find, find the slideshow and, and peruse it at your leisure. Um, but, frankly, I just so enjoy putting these things together <laughs> that I can't help myself. Once I, it, once I was invited uh, to participate in this, I started assembling slides. Whenever I had a thought, I made a slide. So it, it doesn't always flow with the greatest of continuity. I've done my best to sort of stitch it so that it makes some kind of sense. Uh, it's just that there's so much to say on this topic. Um, and, you know, it's, and, and I would encourage all of you to give it plenty of thought. Uh, and then act on uh, what you have, uh, have concluded. So, and there's my email if you want to follow up anything that's uh, said here and, uh, and uh, continue a conversation, I am happy to engage in that way too. So, I am delighted to be back. Uh, this is actually my third honors lecture and I looked back to check the dates and it turns out that I'm doing this on pretty much five year intervals. So I'm looking forward to 2025 Aren't we all, right? <laughs> you remember a song, a very popular song? Some, no, none of you is going to remember it. My colleagues will perhaps remember in the year 2525. <laughs> if man is still alive, right? Isn't that kind of a, that was an optimistic uh, question <laughs> when you think about it. Um, and so let us hope. Anyway, I was here in 2009 to talk about the best and wisest gift, what we owe all children, right? And that comes from John Dewey. His, a uh, book, The School and Society, where he said that, uh, well, well, fundamentally what he was saying was that they're all our children. If we are committed to a, a democracy and to social values like equality, th then, you know, it's not just uh, those of us who have children under our roofs who need to think of the future uh, generations as being ours and, 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 uh, and vice versa, for that matter. And then I was here in 2014 to talk about medical materialism, health, and the pursuit of happiness. That, uh, that series was on the philosophy of health and happiness, I believe, or maybe not the philosophy of, that was my contribution. Um, and so here we are going on six years later for today's event. Uh, so yeah, maybe 20, 25, 26, something like that will be my time again. Anyway, uh, the, the pitch has been made, so I don't need to belabor it, but you know, you, you really do need to register and vote. I stopped at the booth outside where they're registering people, and the guy was uh, uh, 
uh, uh, eager to hand me all the information you would need. If you still need to know anything about registering and voting, I think it's all right here. I'll tell you how to do it. So uh, come and grab this if you need to before you leave today. And, um, you know, I've got a, got a bumper sticker. I put my bumper stickers in places other than bumpers mostly, but uh, I've got a bumper sticker on my office door that says Vote Climate. And uh, I, I w will be advocating for that, <laughs> for that suggestion. You need to p pay attention to what the candidates say about climate. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not an advocate of single issue voting, but if there were going to be a single issue that ought to be at the centerpiece of your thinking, I, I, would, I would propose this one. <laughs> really important. Well, and one more preliminary. I hope you all enjoyed the Super Bowl uh, <laughs> and, uh, and that your team won. Mine actually did for a change. Um, or at least I hope you enjoyed the commercials. I love the Bill Murray Groundhog uh, Day commercial. Uh, that was my favorite, I think, of the a bunch. And he reminded us there that there are no do-overs when it comes to sustaining a habitable climate. There might be do-overs in Punxsutawney, <laughs> but we've you know, we got to get it right the first time. Um, the thing I like most about Super Sunday is that there are now just nine days until pitchers and catchers report to spring training, by the way, for uh, those of you who care. And there you go. Uh, I knew my, at least one person in the audience would appreciate that. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and uh, yeah, yeah, planet Earth, planet baseball, right? Uh, we, we only got one that we can inhabit for the time being. At least I, I can only inhabit that one. <laughs> anyway, there we are. My biology major daughter, with, with whom I'm going to uh, make earnest attempt not to uh, uh, call out, right, because I've been warned not to. She, in fact, she may or may not even be in this room. I, I don't know. Uh, tells me that my slides are too wordy. Uh, and they are, um, and I'm not going to say all the words that are in my slides, I, you know, but if you're interested in seeing more of the words than I speak, then you can look it up at the address that I'll give you in a bit. Uh, but that is due, that, that, uh, that wordiness of my slides in these presentations is due to the fact that I had an, a mentor, an esteemed mentor at Vanderbilt named John Locks. He's still there, <laughs> amazingly. Um, and he would always hand out hard copies of his talks. You know, he, he, he went to great uh, departmental expense to print out copies of everything that he ever said. <laughs> and always passed those out at all of his talks uh, on the uh, premise that audiences do a better job of tracking if they can get that information through more than one portal. And uh, that makes sense to me, that reading and listening is better than just doing one or the other. If you can possibly do both, that's a good thing. Um, now, some of you are going to already guess where I'm going with this strange image. That's not supposed to be a caricature of John Locke, by the way, uh, although in some ways I see a resemblance. <laughs> but uh, as an environmental ethicist, um, a, uh, referring to myself, who wishes to speak for the trees, I don't do hard copies because, you know, we need, we need the trees. Um, but the words are here if you want to see them now or later, and here's the address. My slideshows are all posted at this site called slideshare.net uh, slash ossifer. Ossifer, that's my handle on Twitter and elsewhere, and it's because when I was taking a, a break from academia a few years ago, between the time when they said, go do your PhD, and the time when I said, I'm going to go do my PhD, <laughs> I was working at this wonderful bookstore in Nashville called Davis Kid. I don't know if you uh, remember that. It was, it's across the street was across the street from what is now the wonderful little bookshop called Parnassus. But uh, back in the day, it was a big, wonderful, independent bookstore. It was, it's now a bank, and, and it's a desecration for it to be a bank. But anyway, uh, back when I was working there, I had a colleague who thought it was the funniest thing. I was Phil Oliver, the philosopher, and so he just started calling me Mr. Ossifer. That's where my handle comes from. I am Mr. Ossifer. It, it's better than Dr. Phil, which other people sometimes also call me, but anyway. So the Lorax, I mean, I, I do want to say a, a word about trees, even though Donald Trump uh, made uh, Greta Thunberg angry when he said that, uh, that the U.S. is doing everything it needs to do for the climate. Uh, it's, it's joined the Trillion Tree Initiative. And she said, this is about more than trees. <laughs> uh, but it is about trees, and trees are very important. Dr. Seuss's character, the Lorax, uh, uh, and I do prefer the original version, the, uh, uh, the cartoon, not the uh, Jim Carrey version myself, but never mind. Pick, pick your Lorax. Um, it's, I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. And that's, I mean, that's an important point. It, they can't speak for themselves. Um, we, are, we are the speaking uh, organ on this planet. Right? So if somebody's going to speak for the trees, it's got to be us. And of course, uh, Dr. Seuss introduced the concept of the onceler. Right? The onceler, the onceler who uses things up one, once and uh, done, <laughs> right? uh, including trees. The onceler said, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares, a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better, it's not. 
And that would be, I guess that's the main message I want to convey here today to people uh, uh, of, uh, of the up and coming uh, uh, generation. You're going to have to care <laughs> uh, a whole awful lot because my generation did not. I didn't mean to, to sound susical there, but there you go. And uh, while we're on trees, I just wanted to call your attention to this wonderful old tree that's uh, on the property of the Oaklands, just not too far from our campus if you've never seen it. It's one of the older trees in this community, 130-foot tall white oak tree on the Oakland's property on the National Register. dates to the 1770s. It's, it's cool to just go commune with old trees from time to time and remind yourself that uh, life on this planet is not just all about us, and, and it shouldn't be. You know, there's a past, and, we, and we're responsible for doing our part to make sure there's a future for all kinds of life on our planet. Uh, another uh, tree uh, source uh, is... Uh, one of my favorite novelists, Richard Powers, who wrote The Overstory, and that won all kinds of prizes last year. Um, terrific novelist who's written about artificial intelligence and, and uh, uh, you know, brain injuries and uh, you name it. He's, uh, he's a good philosopher as well as a writer of fiction. Uh, but he says in this book, among other, uh, many other astute things, this is not our world with trees in it. It's a world of trees where humans have just arrived, uh, comparatively speaking. The best arguments in the world won't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. So he told the overstory. And, uh, and, and we need to plug ourselves into a good story that will encourage us all, or more, more of us, <laughs> to, uh, to care the way the Lorac, the Lorac said that we should. He also said that what you make from a tree should be at least as miraculous as what you cut down. I don't think we've been doing that <laughs> very well. I see how many elective uh, cutdowns there are in just my neighborhood all the time, just so people can add another few square feet onto their, onto their uh, box. You can't come back to something that's gone. It's another way of saying we don't want to be one slurs, right? People aren't the apex species they think they are. Other creatures, bigger, smaller, slower, faster, older, younger, more powerful, call the shots, make the air and eat sunlight. Without them, nothing. Right? We, need, we need to put ourselves in our place and realize that we're not the whole show. Uh, overstory, in case you, you're not familiar with the term, is, is, uh, is a term that means the larger, taller trees of growth uh, that shade the younger trees, uh, which is called the understory, right? the overstory, understory. And it's all about a good story. Uh, I'm going to get off the tree theme any second now, but uh, I couldn't stop thinking about them. So the giving tree, you may know the giving tree, uh, Shel Silverstein. Uh, and basically the story is that uh, trees are there for us uh, throughout our lives. Right? Uh, first, they, they provide sustenance, and, and then they provide shade. And in the meantime, I, I think they provide a pretty good uh, example of how to survive, <laughs> how, to, how to survive peaceably. They do no harm, and they do a lot of good, and they suck the carbon out, and you know, we need more trees. Uh, and then uh, <laughs> Freddie the Leaf, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, children's stories for children of all ages. Uh, Freddie the Leaf. Uh, I, I may have introduced that. I'll have to ask my kids uh, whether I introduced that story to them sooner than they were ready for it. But uh, it's a story about coming to terms with, uh, with mortality. Right? Freddie is a leaf, and he notices some of his friends are falling from the tree. And anyway, there's a good life lesson there, uh, a, good, a good way to raise that very difficult subject when the time is right. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, what's our story? Uh, uh, what's the, uh, the, the headline? We are in big trouble. Over the coming 25 or 30 years, scientists say the climate is likely to gradually warm. With more extreme weather, coral reefs and other sensitive habitats are starting to die. Longer term, if emissions rise unchecked, scientists fear climate effects so severe that they might destabilize governments, produce waves of refugees, precipitate the sixth mass extinction of plants and animals in, Earth, in the Earth's history, melt the polar ice caps, cause the seas to rise enough to flood most of the world's coast. This is not good news, <laughs> needless to say. And uh, the emissions that create those risks are happening now, raising deep moral questions for our generation, your gen well, raising questions for us all, moral questions. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, released a shocking report, uh, Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Centigrade, an equally accurate but more evocative title could have been, We're Almost Out of Time. It is shocking, not because those working on the science are surprised by the messages. Indeed, they're all based on existing and published science. But because in aggregate, the message is extraordinary and alarming. The diversity and the severity of impacts from climate change read like a narrative we might see in a Hollywood film, but are in fact, disconcertingly, the clear-eyed projections of where we are heading in reality 
barring massive economic mobilization and rapid transition to cleaner technologies. So this brings me to an explanation of my title, uh, Greta. Uh, I, heard, I heard her uh, introduce herself as Greta, but I'm not going to say that. Uh, we first uh, became aware of her, didn't we, when she was 15 years old. I think she's up to 17 at this point, and she's maybe the most prominent and uh, impactful climate activist in the world today. <laughs> Named Time Magazine's Person of the Year. What do you do for an encore when you're 17 years old and you're already Time Magazine's Person of the Year? But what she said was, we can't just continue living as if there was no tomorrow. There is a tomorrow. That's all we're saying. In other words, her generation is speaking to my generation, uh, saying, Stop being oncelers. <laughs> no, leave us a legacy, please. Al Gore, uh, who is, uh, uh, I guess I have to say, of my generation. I mean, I have to. I'm, I'm actually a fan of Al Gore. I've got a photograph of myself with uh, Al Gore right after I started teaching here, right while he was still licking his wounds from uh, <laughs> the election that he won but lost. Uh, he came and spoke, and I talked to him, and I got somebody to snap our picture. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a fan. I've been a fan of Al Gore's for a long time mostly because of his leadership over the climate crisis. Um, he's a big Greta fan, and he said, This moment feels different. Throughout history, many great morally-based movements have gained traction at the very moment when young people decided to make that movement their cause. So, uh, Greta is a, a good leader for our time and for yours. She met the, uh, the mucky mucks at uh, Davos in that, that annual meeting up in the Swiss Alps where the world's richest and powerful, uh, most powerful and most self-important people meet every year. <laughs> and she, uh, again, pulled no, uh, pulled no punches. She said, I wonder what you will tell your children was the reason to fail and leave them facing the climate chaos you knowingly brought upon them. Good question. <laughs> the uh, Secretary of the Treasury tried to call her out said she, she needed to go take an economics course. She didn't know what she's talking about, All right? And, uh, and of course, the president, as I already alluded, has said, well, yeah, we're, we're, we're taking care of trees. <laughs> we got it. But Paul Krugman in the Times, New York Times comments, one can only surmise that uh, Secretary Mnuchin, Treasury Secretary, slept through his undergraduate economics classes. Otherwise, he would know that every, and I mean every, major Econ 101 textbook argues for government regulation or taxation of activities that pollute the environment. Because otherwise, neither producers nor consumers have an incentive to take the damage inflicted by this pollution into account. Right? Because we're short-term onceers, and we don't think about the long term. Uh, she's very active on social media. Uh, this is a, a tweet uh, from not too long ago, when, uh, or just a few days ago, the Guardian, the newspaper, has announced it will no longer accept advertising from oil and gas companies, becoming the first major global news organization to institute an outright ban on taking money from companies that extract fossil fuels. Greta is quoting that and says, and she says, it's a good start. Who will take this further? I mean, she is really leading in, uh, in the uh, social media environment where so many more people can be reached, frankly, than can be reached through newspapers anymore, like The Guardian. You know, you, well, Guardian's online. It's one of the good places to go for reliable and professional, uh, professional journalistic information. So there is a tomorrow, and we need to acknowledge that, but what is the forecast? Cloudy, gray, much warmer. Now, I, I was just uh, thinking, you know, uh, <laughs> one of my favorite quotes is from the old New Yorker writer E.B. White, who uh, uh, he said, uh, I get up in the morning torn between a desire to enjoy the world and the desire to save it. <laughs> and I feel like that's kind of where we are with uh, with our situation in the, in the climate crisis. But I love it when it's 60, 70 degrees in January, February, December. But now I have to wonder, uh, should I be enjoying that quite so much, given that uh, it may be token, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, gradual but inexorable warming of our planet in, uh, you know, in uh, a direction that, for, that, that uh, forebodes uh, very ill? Uh, well, I, I still do enjoy, and, and I would recommend, I, I teach a happiness class, and I, I recommend that you should enjoy nice days, but you should also do the work to find out if they're in, in, inordinately nice uh, too often, why that is and what, what should be done about it. But anyway, we are in big trouble, as we've already noticed, and uh, this is most especially trouble for your generation and those to follow. Al Gore again has said, we as a species must make a decision. How absurd that sounds. It sounds absurd because we've never made a decision as a species. And it seems implausible to think that we could, but continuing on our present course would threaten the entirety of human civilization. So we need to figure out a way to make a species-level decision to change 
course, radically. Um, and uh, you know, we could well have only a decade within which to make major changes. Now, we've been saying that for a few decades now, so I'm not sure what the window, uh, you know, what, how wide the window still is. But we need to act as though the house was on fire. And uh, you know, in, he's known for earth and the balance and then an inconvenient truth and the future. And that's where our focus needs to be, not to be so contentedly present-oriented and once-oriented. Uh, as I said, Al's a, a Greta fan. Here's the good news. A new front is beginning to appear on our radar in this uh, fight. The rise of a new generation of engaged activists uh, led by Greta Thunberg. Uh, which leads longtime climate crusader Al Gore to hope for a bright new dawn. He says, as I've quoted already, this moment does feel different. He was here. I hope uh, many of you got the chance to see him in the Tucker Auditorium in September. Al was here along with Dr. Evans, and, and uh, others were on that panel as well. And he was asked, I mean, much of his talk was not concerned with the climate explicitly, but he was asked bef shortly before uh, that session adjourned uh, what he wanted students in the audience to understand about the climate crisis, and he said, we know what we have to do. And, and to him, that, that in itself is, an, is a, uh, an item of hope. We know what we have to do. And what's not to like about doing the right thing? Once you've identified what the right thing is, just go do it. I mean, it sounds very simple. It's not simple at all. Lots of obstacles in the way. but. If you're going to be an optimistic person, you've got to be optimistic in recognizing that we now know, know what we have to do. We have to get off our addiction to fossil fuels. That's the biggest thing we've got to do. And then uh, just a few days after he appeared here on campus, he published this editorial in which he said, we have the tools, now we're building the power, right? the political power. The climate crisis is the battle of our time, and we can win. Uh, he, you know, this uh, enumerates things that you're, you're already familiar with, I'm sure, about all the climate uh, impacts that we're seeing that are a clear indication, uh, clear indication of the, of the uh, crisis mounting. But then he says, uh, to sum it up, the accumulation of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases, some of which will envelop the planet for hundreds of, and possibly thousands of years, is now trapping as much extra energy daily as 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs would release every 24 hours. I, just, I can't wrap myself around that, but that's... That's, that's astonishing. So some people think it's time for a revolution. Revolution can mean more or less radical things to different people. But there is a, a, a revolution, a self-styled revolution brewing amongst many of your generation. They call themselves the Sunrise Movement. They say we're building an army of young people to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process as we transition off of fossil fuels to more sustainable sources. And uh, they have, by the way, uh, endorsed Bernie, in case you're curious. So th that's the revolution in question that many of them mean. But I don't think you have to be a Bernie supporter to uh, acknowledge that things have to change, and rapidly. Earth Day. Uh, I remember being uh, in middle school uh, when the first Earth Day happened in 1970, and happened to have a, a teacher uh, in uh, social studies a young woman, I think probably fresh out of college, who was very attuned to Earth Day and, and, uh, and, and uh, the environment. And, um, and I remember she, you know, she, she made a big deal of it. And so it's been a big deal to me really ever since. Uh, you know, if you ever doubt that your early teachers can have an impression on you, just think back to a few middle school moments. Uh, and I've got lots of those. But Earth Day was on my radar from the very beginning. And... On uh, January 18, 1970, the New York Times ran this full-page ad announcing a day of environmental action. This day was the first Earth Day. Now, I picked up my paper. I actually brought a prop in. <laughs> picked up my Sunday New York Times yesterday. Got to the back of the front section, and there you go, is uh, the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Is this coming April the 22nd? So uh, I imagine that might have something to do with why, why we've got this lecture series. <laughs> Maybe, right? It makes perfect sense that it should be. And the idea is that we celebrate Earth Day to make a commitment to making life better, not just bigger and faster, which, you know, if, if your only values are once economic, industrial values, then that's all you're focused on. But to make life better, you've got to look at the big picture in the long, the long run. To provide real rather than rhetorical solutions, a day for looking beyond tomorrow, that's April the 22nd. So I hope you plan to uh, commemorate it or participate in it or in some other way mark it 
as a, a day of real reflection as well as action. One of the people who keeps me focused these days on these issues and keeps me engaged uh, and, uh, and committed, even though there's plenty of cause for, uh, for uh, uh, disappointment and, and, uh, and uh, sometimes anger over the way people in positions of power are not engaged in this issue. But one of the people that I, I regularly listen to on this topic is Margaret Wrinkle, who was also on our campus as part of that same uh, uh, event back in September. She was on a, a different panel. Um, but she's a New York Times columnist who happens to live in and is based in Nashville. And uh, grew up in Alabama, is now a Nashvillian, and she is sort of uh, the New York Times window on the South, I guess. That's, that's her official role. But most of the, much of the time, she writes about the environment, climate issues, and pointed out that on Christmas Day, it was 70 degrees in Nashville, which in the past, I would have just said, hooray, lucky us. Now I say, hooray, I'm going to enjoy 70 degrees, but I'm going to fret about it, too. And she says... Uh, it's always a mistake to confuse weather for climate, which people often make. It's, that's why people say, you know, <laughs> it's why people uh, bring snowballs onto the floor of the Congress and say, what, what global warming? <laughs> um, but my point is, uh, it's just a fact. All five of the five warmest years on record have occurred since 2015, right? It's just really not possible to deny that this is happening. And so... That's why this age, is, it's been proposed that our age is, you know, is, is the Anthropocene, the age of man, age of humans, and their impact right there atop all of those, uh, all of those previous epochs. And uh, last year was the 43rd year in a row in which temperatures across the planet measured above average. There can be no reasonable argument. This is the Anthropocene. Okay. In another column, she said... Uh, that if 2019 is truly the year we woke up to climate change, then 2020 should be the year we actually start doing something about it. We're nearly out of time. And uh, to paraphrase what she's gone on to say here and uh, in the, the larger column, she's saying one of the things that you really need to do uh, is to care. And the way you care is you fall in love with nature and, 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 your, and your world. And that, in her case, includes things like beetles and spiders and bats and box turtles, and she's always telling you what's going on in her backyard. Uh, and that's a good place to start. You know, if you're going to care about the earth, you need to care about your own backyard. Think globally, act locally, <laughs> that, that idea. Uh, I wrote this, uh, this uh, I made this slide on uh, New Year, I think New Year's Day. Happy New Year, it's 2020. <clears throat> and the forecast for the next decade is cloudy with an apprehension of doom, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, and this is the other side of the story uh, from the one Al Gore was telling, half to two-thirds of Americans now uh, believe that humans, uh, that climate change is caused by humans. So that means a whole lot of people still don't believe it, but a whole lot more believe it now than would have said so just a few years ago. Right? So uh, things do change, and, and uh, attitudes can change, and that's good news. Right? Uh, but here's a key point, that, <coughs> that climate change is less a problem of individual belief than it is of collective action. Right? We've got to do big things, and we've got to do that in concert with other people if we're going to make a difference. Right? Uh, the most efficient route toward enacting changes in public policy lies not in convincing deniers. There are climate deniers among us, but the key is don't try to convince all the climate deniers. You'll be wasting your time for the most part. But pay more attention to galvanizing those who already do believe that we have a crisis. Mobilize those people. Get those people to go vote. Right? I mean, I want everybody to go vote, but I particularly want the people who care about the issues I care about to go vote. And so should we all. That's the way democracy is supposed to work. Peter Singer, a, uh, an ethicist, uh, maybe the most famous ethicist in the world today, uh, wrote a book a few years ago called One World Now, and it was his early take on globalization. Right? Now he's updated it with, with a, a particular interest in the climate and says, to live an ethical life, it is essential that we minimize our carbon footprint. And then he says, our overriding obligation as individuals is to be activist citizens and do our best to persuade our government to come together with other governments to find a global solution. And you do that at the polls. Right? You've got to vote for the people who support that and want to get us back in the Paris Climate Accords and that kind of thing. Right? Uh, I'm going to fill, uh, cycle through some more of these. Uh, we use this book uh, very... I, I love the Very Short Introduction series. It uh, serves so many of our purposes in the classroom. And we use the uh, Very Short Introduction to the Anthropocene in uh, Environmental Ethics last time. And I would uh, urge any of you who wants to get a, a, you know, a quick overview of the field, take a look at that. I particularly want to highlight 
what he says here, uh, again, continuing the story theme, you know, right? Uh, Got to tell a good story. And a true story, the Anthropocene remains a work in progress. I mean, this is still the age of man. We're not done. Right? And the, the last chapters remain to be written. Is this the story of an unprecedented planetary disaster or of newfound wisdom and redemption? And time will tell, but not, we're not, you can't just sit back and wait for time to tell. We've got to, we've got to engage. Um, this uh, outbreak, uh, the, uh, the coronavirus outbreak, uh, reminds us that humanity's influence uh, goes to the microbial world as well as to the macro world. Microbes are not exempt. Um, no, one more, one more indication of our influence and how our travel um, impacts and uh, sometimes uh, uh, fatally impacts lives. Right? Uh, this guy, uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who writes very interesting books, wrote Homo Deus, A History of Tomorrow, paradoxical title. But, uh, but he reminds us that the Anthropocene isn't a brand new thing, uh, uh, that uh, already tens of thousands of years ago, our Stone Age ancestors were spreading to the four corners of the earth and changing the flora and the fauna wherever they went. Not always a bad thing. We're not always an invasive species. But the point is that we need to just acknowledge that our impact uh, is real and has been. And it's just, it's growing. <laughs> you know, technology grows our uh, impact, but it's been around. It, it, is, uh, it is what we do. We impact our environment. Um, another uh, interesting thought that uh, in this book that's now about a decade old, and this guy was pressing it. He was already raising the issues that uh, matter much uh, in this very moment, confronting climate collapse. Um, and he says, climate destabilization to which we are already committed will change everything. Now, and that, of course, triggered my thought of Naomi Klein's work, who wrote a book called This Changes Everything. We're left with a stark choice. This is her analysis, which is, I suppose, controversial, um, but, uh, but still um, you know, profoundly important, if, if, if correct, especially if correct. We're left with a stark choice. Allow climate disruption to change everything about our world or change pretty much everything about our economy to avoid that fate. You know, restructure our economy so that we're not still oncelers. That's my shorthand for what she's talking about. We need to be very clear. Because of our decades of collective denial, no gradual incremental options are now available to us. We've got to act fast. Her latest book is called On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. So I'd urge you to pay attention to uh, those who are advocating for that. The Green New Deal, you know, initiative on the scale of the, of the New Deal of, of the 1930s that uh, got us uh, out, out of the Depression. Well, the, the war helped too, didn't it? But in any case, the idea is to think big in terms of responding to a crisis, to come to acknowledge that we are facing a crisis. Um, and then she talks about how we're schismatic uh, about this. A part of the time we're focused on, on uh, climate issues and the rest of the time we're distracted by online shopping and, and uh, checking our Twitter and our Instagram and whatever. And so, it, you know, it's going to take a real effort of attention on our part to stay focused enough on this issue to, to be engaged with it and make a difference. Getting close to the end. I want to give time for a discussion here, but I do want to acknowledge or address some of the fault lines that keep people divided on this issue. One of them, uh, some see a fault line on climate between religion on the one hand and secular human, humanists uh, and the like on the other. Um, and one of those is this guy Martin Hegland, who has written This Life, Secular Faith and Spiritual Freedom. And he says, climate change and the possible destruction of the earth cannot be seen as an existential threat from the standpoint of religious faith. The point he's making is, and this is also controversial, uh, but the point he's making is that he, he believes that religious people are less engaged and committed to addressing climate issues because their eye is on, uh, you know, their eye is on an, another destiny. He says, if you have religious faith, you believe that all finite life can be terminated and yet what is truly valuable will remain. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, nodding to the controversy, that I'm curious to know what Dean Vile is going to say about that when he shares a biblical view here in April. That, uh, you know, that will continue that conversation. But what I want to say about it for now is one pro at least one prominent secular humanist says the climate crisis is bigger than that. It's bigger than that debate. It's bigger than the dispute between religionists and secularists. And that would be the biologist E.O. Wilson, who several years ago wrote a book called The Creation. Um, 
where he wrote an open letter that began, Dear Pastor, and he was addressing former co-religionists. He grew up in the uh, Southern Baptist tradition in Alabama, E.O. Wilson, before he went off and got corrupted at Harvard and <laughs> so <laughs> corrupted. Um, and so what he is saying in his open letter is, I know you well enough to call you friend. Well, I hope you did. But he says, we grew up in the same faith. I no longer belong to that faith, but I'm confident that if we met and spoke privately of our deepest beliefs, it would be in a spirit of mutual respect and goodwill. Well, it only would be if both parties to the conversation intended it to be, but I, I take E.O. Wilson at his word here. He says, I suggest that we set aside our differences over religion to save the creation. The, and calling it the creation, of course, if you wanted to be picky, that could beg a question, right? Was it, was it a creation or was it a, you know, a cosmical event? In any case, the defense of living nature, which Wilson here agrees to call the creation, is a universal value. We should all care about that, whether we're religious or not. Right? Uh, it doesn't arise rise from, nor does it promote any religious or ideological dogma. Rather, it serves without discrimination the interests of all humanity. Pastor, we need your help. The creation, living nature is in deep trouble. I just want to endorse that and echo that. My own spiritual take uh, on this goes back to my, one of my uh, early heroes, Carl Sagan. I always say Carl Sagan probably is one of the people who got me thinking in, in uh, ways that in retrospect now look to me to be philosophic. My first philosophical musings came from encountering Carl Sagan's little The Cosmic Connection, <laughs> his first published book, popular book, of, uh, you know, trying to popularize astronomy. Pale Blue Dot. Right? And if you've never encountered his wonderful monologue, The Pale Blue Dot, you know, just go to YouTube and enter, enter that as the search terms, and you'll get a gazillion renditions of the pale blue dot. But basically what he's saying is, when you look at our planet from a, not a very deep cosmic perspective, this is from, from the Voyager craft right before it exited the solar system in, what, 1989 or so. He, Sagan got the engineers at NASA, he had to really twist arms, but he got them to agree to turn the cameras on Earth from that distance and take a photograph, because he thought that that would have the same kind of impact that that famous Apollo Earthrise photograph of the moon had in terms of triggering people's environmental sensibilities and, and consciousness. And so that's, that if, it, you probably can't even see it from the back rows, that little dot, which Carl Sagan so poetically describes as a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam, and he says, that's here, that's us, that's everything you've ever known or everyone you'll ever love, everything. A mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam, and he concludes that oration by saying, the earth is the only world known so far to harbor life there's nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, no. At least not yet. Uh, so like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we must make our stand. And that's why, that's why these issues are so darn important. We have a responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. We shouldn't be pushing other species to extinction. We're sawing off the limb on which we perch when we do that. Martin Rees, another astronomer, good ideas. But... There's a very recent New York Times op-ed, The Dearth of Optimistic Visions of the Future is Central to the Psychic Atmosphere of This Bleak Era. So we need to, we need to be more optimistic and more future-oriented, that, that article was saying. Don't stop thinking about tomorrow. I just want to end on this note. Don't panic. You know, uh, we shouldn't be panicking. We should be very, uh, you know, very attentive. I don't think we need to panic, as Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide, told us. And as Elon Musk has told us. He launched his Tesla and said, don't panic on, on the uh, view screen. <laughs> but, you know, if this happened, I would panic. You know, this, this, uh, the New Yorker ran this uh, image the other day of uh, alien visitation. Hello, Earthlings, we're here to destroy you. I, I, that, that might be panic time. Uh, but the point here, <laughs> the point is, uh, they don't need to, to do it. We're already doing it to ourselves. They report, another method of planetary annihilation that has worked for us in the past is accelerating a planet's climate crisis. The aliens addressing Earthlings. We had a whole plan laid out to melt your glaciers and polar ice caps, but it turns out you've already melted most of those things on your own. <laughs> We're doing a fine job. On, we don't need any aliens to come here <laughs> and uh, precipitate our demise. Uh, so I'm, I'm you know, taking a lighthearted uh, you know, approach to say that, but it's a serious thing. We need to stop being the aliens amongst ourselves who are going to destroy our planet. Finally, there is a tomorrow is an aspirational statement. How can we make it so? Perhaps with an eye on the clock, and this is from Daniel Hillis, a uh, computer guy, uh, who's associated with something called the Long Now Foundation. 
<coughs> and he's, he had this idea, some people think crazy idea, it's a wonderfully symbolic idea at least, that we need to have a visible symbol of our commitment to a long-term future. He says, why don't we build a 10,000-year clock and put it in a mountain somewhere? And it'll be something that future generations of humans and post-humans can make pilgrimage to, to remind themselves, to rededicate themselves to the long-term future of our species. Uh, and uh, maybe that's the way we need to try to train ourselves to think. Uh, Michael Chabon, a best-selling novelist, wrote an essay called The Omega Glory, inspired by Star Trek. He's a, he's a Star Trek guy, uh, showrunner of the new Picard series, by the way. Uh, and he wrote an essay about the clock, the 10,000-year clock, the clock of the long now, they call it. And he told his kid about it when his kid was 10 years old or something. And, and his, uh, his son said, uh, will there really still be, be people then, Dad, in 10,000 years? And uh, Shabon said, yes. I told him without hesitation, yes. Now, of course, no way any of us can know that uh, or maybe even believe it. <laughs> but he says, and this is uh, my last word, if you don't believe in the future unreservedly and, and dreamingly, if you aren't willing to bet that somebody will be there to cry when the clock finally 10,000 years from now runs down, then I don't see how you can have children. Having children is committing yourself to the next generation, and from that, uh, surely it's just a short, it's a short step to caring about the future of your species. And that's what I say here. It's intuitive to me that we, if we care about our children, about the next generation, then it is a small step to care about the long-term fate of life on Earth. That's the bet we take when we have children. And in the spirit of John Dewey that I alluded to back at the beginning, they're all our children, right? It's not just the children under your own roof that matter. We're all in this starship together. And I guess I'll stop right there. So thank you very much. I'd love to open. I won't stop right there because I've got some questions for you before you try to think of some for me. Uh, I always like to end a class with discussion questions. So here are some, some prompts. If you've got a better question to respond to or to, or to, to uh, engage with, please do. But uh, these are some of the questions that you might want to think about and maybe speak to here as I open the floor. Is there a, t is there a tomorrow? Do you think there is a tomorrow, you younger people? Is there a future for your generation? Uh, and for the other species that we share this planet with, are you optimistic, pessimistic, neither, both, or maybe uh, both on alternate days? Uh, how do you think America and or the world will have changed in 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? Uh, and so if I got some more questions, there, but that, that, that's enough. Yes, please. Um, I would say answering the, uh, are you optimistic, pessimistic, both or neither, um, I would say I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, I, I, I grew up in a Christian household, and I am still a Christian, uh, but I honestly think that the issue of climate change is, what, from what I've seen between my parents who are very religious, uh, it, it the barrier between religion and secularism is kind of breaking down uh, from what I've seen. Uh, and I just think I, there's really no reason to go to cleaner, to not go to cleaner energy. Uh, it's it's in becoming the economically more. It, yeah, it's, it's become like so, solar, as solar panels become more uh, efficient or, and wind becomes more efficient. Um, really, it's not even an issue of trying to save the planet anymore. It's trying to find a way to generate energy once fossil fuels run out because they're finite. Right. They are finite. We, we, you know, we keep having to remind ourselves. I thought, you know, when I was, uh, when I was a college student and, uh, and uh, Jimmy Carter gave his malaise speech and uh, dialed down the speed limits and all that, and we all, you know, for a while all uh, looked at driving more economical vehicles, I thought, you know, that uh, surely this is going to be, you know, this is going to be the, the beginning of the end of our fossil fuel addiction. I, I wouldn't have imagined in 1976 and 7 and 8 that uh, you know, we would have this, you know, this reversion back to all the, you know, the SUVs and, and the you know, lowered uh, emission standards and so forth. So that's been a big disappointment in my lifetime that <laughs> I've seen. But I, I'm glad to hear that you think that we're turning back in the other direction again and, and that, you know, it, it only makes economic sense that we should do so. Um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, the, the fuel, the fossil fuels are going to run out, and there's no question about that at some point. And, and, and if we remain committed to economic growth, you know, indefinitely, then we're going to need more fuel while the traditional supply is dwindling. It just makes such good sense to, to do everything we can to transition to solar and wind and, 
and whatever, you know, and to get behind the wheel of an electric vehicle. That's one of my ambitions now at, the, at this point in my lifetime is, is uh, you know, I've driven Toyota Corollas, my last two vehicles, and my next one is going to be a Leaf or a, one of the other, you know, one of the other electric vehicles. Uh, as soon as I can get past the resistance to the idea that I can't go 300 miles, you know. <laughs> I've got a conference I'm going up to uh, Kansas for, um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't get there. I don't think I could reliably get there in time if I was driving it and had to depend on charging stations. So that, you know, we've really got to work on the infrastructure to support the smart thing. So that's why I'm pessimist. <laughs> that's okay. Me, as, as an, the old guy in the room. Yeah. I mean, I've heard this story before. Right? And this story has been going on since I was a kid, since I was in 1970. And, you know, and it continues to go on. And I look and it's 2020 and I'm 60 years old. Things haven't changed. And nothing's Back changed. Backwards. We're yeah. still constantly talking about, well, the problem is batteries and battery life. We're talking about the same things that we could have solved, we could have solved years, years ago if we would have made a commitment to doing it we had the and put the right economic incentives in, which never seemed to be there. Right. And, that, and that's why, I mean, I hated one of your last slides, and I'm going to be honest with you, <laughs> is I think you got to make it a crisis for change to occur. I think if you don't make it a crisis, then oh, I, everybody I, says it's optimistic, hey, we're going to get to it, we're going to get to that. Until it's where you're at a point where somebody says, look, it, we're gonna, it's going to end here soon. Um, humans don't do anything. Well, I, I'm totally in agreement with you. <laughs> and I hope I didn't say anything to suggest that I don't think we face a crisis situation. But you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's why I sit there. I mean, that, that's my struggle at this time. And I'm the biologist in the room, right? Yeah. I mean, and you know, your first question, there are no other species, right? We're in, the, we're in this incredible extinction where things are going away daily. And, yeah. It, and, you know, pretty soon we're going to wake up and there's going to be nothing out there. And it would have been mostly because of us. Yeah. And, you know, that's why I worry about that side. I mean, I mean this is the future, but we failed. You're, you're, you're totally right to worry, and I worry right there with you. But you know what? Uh, I, I think things have changed in, in so far as uh, 40 years ago. There wasn't a wide consensus on what it was that we needed to do to make the big change. Uh, I think, you know, the idea of wind and solar seemed just really weird to a lot of people back then uh, and seemed un, un, uh, unfeasible. But we're, in a, we're in a climate right now where those incentives are gone anyways. They were taken away in a large number of cases right. in the last six years or five years, or even less, but let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. You know, so we watched all of that that was pushed forward go away, and until we figure out how to make it a commitment that's a long-term commitment, I'm, I'm worried about where we are. You're right. And, you know, what my granddaughter sees and what the future holds, and, and you guys. But and let me just say, on, on their behalf, that the, there's one other point of, uh, of uh, you know, grounds for optimism. They've got Greta, and they've got a lot of people who think like Greta and who are really paying attention at this point. And that's where m moral movements start, is with a young generation that says, don't rob us of our future. Except that the people voting are the old generation. And it's always the old generation <laughs> who sour and become pessimistic, right? Because they've seen too much. <laughs> it is. Well, it's the exact reason. Because you know, if you look at the demographics of the United States, it's, it's older generation, and, and they're voting opposite of what you are at this point. Yeah, and uh, another reason to consider uh, going to the polls and, and, and voting for the candidate of your choice who happens to be a little bit younger than, uh, you know, people of our generation. <laughs> There's still so many of them running for office. Please join me in thanking our speaker. Thank you.